Hello Swati, it's uh, lovely to meet you today. The date is the um, 2nd of March 2020. Um, I think we are very excited that you are uh, going to be our first interviewee for this project and uh, let us wish all of us good luck. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> good luck and yeah, I feel special. Yes, I feel privileged. Us, um, tell us a bit about yourself, your, where were you born, your upbringing and just give you a bit of your family background. Mm -hmm. So I was born in uh, Maryland, uh, USA, so outside Washington, D.C. in 1987 and uh, lived there. My parents moved to the U.S. in the 70s and met uh, when they were at university together and um, lived in the U.S. for about 15 years until they had me and um, then decided to move back to India in the 90s. So when I was two and a half, I moved back from the U.S. to India. And the more I kind of think about that story as well, the more fascinating I find it as first generational immigrants moving back to where they've come from. People thought they were crazy. They thought, what are you doing? Like you've, you've made it, you're living the dream and you've, you're moving back. It doesn't make any sense. And I think they were really excited about just living in India in the 90s. My dad got a good job at the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. Um, and so they just decided to do it. And um, I'm very happy they did that anyway, but I don't know any better, but in the sense that I, I loved growing up in India until the age of 22. Um, I lived in Ahmedabad until the age of 12, then moved to Chennai, finished my high school there, and then moved to Pune to do my uh, university degree, my undergraduate degree, and then moved to London when I was 22, basically. So I've moved around in India a bit, uh, and then I've been in London now for the last 10 years. So what about your, uh, the musical influences? Uh, 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 yeah, so both my parents um, are, I'll say, semi-professional. Well, they're serious hobbyist singers. They'll get very angry if I say semi-professional. But uh, they have a real keen interest in Hindustani music. And so there was a lot of Hindustani music um, and singing in the house while I was growing up. Um, I started playing the tabla when I was about eight years old um, and I was always encouraged to do various things. I used to play tennis, I used to uh, do theatre, I used to play music. So it was just one of those things that I did as a hobby. Um, and before I knew it, by the time I was 17, I hadn't really paid much attention to music as such, you know. Um, although I loved listening to music and by then I was listening to a lot of rock and roll from the 60s. People like The Doors, The Beatles, uh, Hendrix, all these people were big influences. That kind of moved me on to the blues and also early jazz. So I was listening to people like Dave Brubeck, but then also slowly into Miles Davis and Coltrane and um, Ahmad Jamal and people like that. So a lot of jazz. So by the time I was 17, like I said, I was playing a bit of drum kit as well, but very basic, rudimentary. Uh, all I wanted to do was play drum kit, really, at that point. I didn't really want to have anything to do with the tabla. Um, but I could already play the tabla, because I'd been playing for the last 10 years. And that was a gift that, you know, I'm very kind of privileged now to look back and say, fortunately, I didn't give it up. Because my being able to play even that little bit of tabla meant that I could suddenly think of music as a, a viable option to a career in some way. I started playing in bands, but I was playing tabla in bands, you know, just because I wanted to be in that band environment. Mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't play drums really, so I was just playing tabla in bands. And then slowly tra trans transitioning into playing drums. Um, but yeah, I think I'm very fortunate that I, I, I continued to play the tabla through my kind of high school years, teenage years. And uh, that really helped me make that transition later on, maybe when I was 21, to say, oh, look, this is actually a something that I can do now and I'd like to give it a shot. So yeah. Yes. Can you can you elaborate a little bit how you got into <coughs> tabla in the first place? So how getting into tabla was always um, I still don't really know how it happened in the sense that I've asked my my mom this question is like did I show an interest in tabla or in percussion was I tapping every surface I could find or what 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 was it and she was like well there was just a bunch of lessons happening at the time in where we were living and uh, you said one day that you wanted to learn tabla. You said you want to learn keyboard, do you want to sing, do you want to tabla, it's like tabla. So it was very sort of organic, I mean who knows, you know, it's very difficult to trace 
exactly why. Um, I've tried, but and then, but I've always been sort of fascinated by percussion. Uh, even in bands, I would always my attention would always go to the drummer, you know. Or even when I was watching Hindustani music performances, I'd always go left to the tabla player, you know. So there was always some kind of draw, some attention, you know. So that's how it sort of began. And um, I remember watching this. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this movie. Do you remember this movie called That Thing You Do? Tom Hanks and uh, it was just really like cheesy like <laughs> rock and roll story but the drummer in that film was just like I was like oh my god I was so enamored by him I was like this is the guy that I want to be like this is amazing what he's doing the flair the kind of just confidence the everything that he had this character and um, yeah that was one of my kind of formative memories of wanting to play drums and be that guy in the band um, that's how it kind of started that kind of journey and now um, you know it's taken its own form over the years um, but yeah but you had some um, uh, classical training in Tabla and Pune with, with some guru before you you started here yeah absolutely so I had been playing Tabla uh, I'd learned from a person in Chennai called Rajesh Thavle until I moved to Pune and then in Pune I learned from very briefly with a person called Nishikant Badodekar who is a, a student of Allah Rakha but then I really met um, one of my all-time, well, young, so I can't really say all-time, but mentors in, in music, a uh, person called Rajiv Devastali, who really, he's a, he was a German teacher at the time, at the Max Müller Bhavan, and he also played tabla. And he taught the tabla in a way that he taught language. So he really like broke it down to the grammar of the instrument, you know, he would teach me phrases and he would say, okay, he would, he would teach me the grammar of compositions. And he would say, take this phrase, take that phrase, and now make your own. And from the first lesson, he told me to be creative. He, he basically forced me to be creative about making my own compositions. And that came as a shock because no one had asked me to make anything of my own until that point. Although I could play, you know. And that's one of the faults of the system itself. Well, faults or not, we can get into. But like in a sense, that was one of the things that you're not really expected to like make up your own things until much later. So he really opened my mind up to rhythm and the way to think about rhythm, to conceive rhythm, to, to talk about time in music, thinking about it as cyclical rather than linear. Um, so really, yeah, the way I kind of think about music now, I think I owe him a lot in a sense, you know. And um, he's been, over the years now, a real kind of uh, influential uh, influential figure in my life. Uh, so, yeah. Sorry, what does your um, uh, guru think of you now? I think he loves it. I, I met him last week. I was in Bangalore, uh, I think, la yeah, last week, two weeks ago. And uh, he comes to all my shows in India. He was in a club. He was there. He's a very open-minded guy. He's, he's lovely. He's um, So, I share... Everything. He's one of those people I hope to be when I'm older. Curious, you know, still curious, still wanting to learn, still interested in what young people are doing. Um, not this kind of stuck up old wise man who just gives, like, imparts knowledge whether you want it or not. Uh, so he's a, he's a lovely uh, person and yeah, he still is. So. And then when you came to, uh, you, you came to Britain to study drums. And, but then you also got in touch with uh, Sanjuji. Yeah, so at first when I came, I only wanted to play drums. I, did, I wasn't thinking about the tabla as such. Um, and I went to a school called Drum Tech. It's a tech music school. It's called. And I was there for two years playing just drums, contemporary music, but also like learning jazz, different styles of music. And then I went to a place called SOAS. I was at SOAS for a year doing my masters uh, in music. That's when I got back in touch with San uh, I wanted to get back in touch with Tabla. I wanted to get back uh, playing because uh, I felt that was uh, something that I hadn't paid attention to for a while and I felt it was time to go back to. Um, then I, that's when I reached out to Sanjuji, uh, Sanju Sahai. And um, my relationship with him began in 2011. And yeah, he's been my teacher since then. And he's a lovely person. Uh, very, very kind and, and generous with his time and knowledge. Has been very supportive as well. He's he's helped me um, get work initially as well as a, as a tabla player. I remember him getting in touch with a lot of people for me or telling me to get in touch with them. Uh, so I played with a lot of uh, Kathak, uh, as accompanying Kathak classes and exams and performances. Um, and I learned a lot 
from from all those experiences as well. Um, so yeah, I owe him a lot as well. Why why have you decided for Sohas? So it's, I think it's not an obvious choice for a musician. Mm. So I think after I did tech music schools, which was a very sort of um, safe kind of contemporary music environment. In a sense, I think one of my pet sort of disappointments when I got there was I was always sort of middle of the class in everything I did growing up. Um, not too, I was fairly shy, I was never great at anything, but never was very bad at anything either. So I was just there in the shadows lurking. Uh, that sounds ominous, but no, I was just there. <laughs> I was just there. But, um, and then I thought when I went to music school that I would finally be able to express myself. But actually what happened is in tech music schools, I was again middle of the class. And that was really an interesting situation because here I was in this creative environment, hoping that this is going to kind of like let the shackles off and I'm going to suddenly be this very expressive person. But actually, I realized that systemically, being an institution like that, which kind of had a very specific idea of what is good and bad, regardless of whether it was music or anything else, was never going to be uh, good enough for me to like really find something that was my own. So it was a kind of difficult period the first two years that I was here. I really wanted to make it. I really wanted to study. So I spent a lot of time practicing, practicing, practicing. And I got very good at my, my technical skills. But equally, I still felt like I hadn't found anything that I could call my own in terms of a voice on the drums or even the kind of music I wanted to pursue. So then going to SOAS was this idea. I was like, OK, look, I've always had a slightly academic bent to things. And I like thinking about music, not just playing. And I thought SOAS would be an interesting place to do a master's degree where I could do performance, but also study ethnomusicology. Um, and that's what kind of led me to go to SOAS. And I'm really I'm lucky I did that because SOAS really opened me up. I suddenly met a lot of people who were coming from all kinds of different sort of uh, access points into music. So scholars, but also people who played all these instruments I'd never heard names of. And suddenly I went back to kind of fundamentally questioning what music is and what role music can play in my life but also in in society in a way like what is the role of music um, and so it was very freeing in many ways and I got a whole year to just explore on my on my own what I wanted to do with my instrument with with all my influences at this point I was also like I said wanting to go back to the tabla and like re kind of um, almost reconnect with that aspect of my life that I'd kind of left uh, the Indian, in a sense, Indian aspect of it, you know. Um, so yeah, that year was very much about kind of finding, this was the first time actually that I, I played the tabla and the drums together. <coughs> um, until that point, I'd actually never played drums and tabla at the same time. Although I'd been studying both those instruments now for over six, seven years. Um, it didn't feel right. I wanted to be good at jazz or Western drum kit and I also wanted to be good at tabla but separately whereas finally I felt like it was time where I could organically then just come and have them come together uh, and that's what happened and since then really it's been a I'd say just an extension of that process of experimenting and trying to find ways to have all these influences and parts of me kind of come out and express themselves in ways that feel natural. Um, but SOAS was in a way the first kind of space where I was, I felt comfortable enough to be just okay with who I was. Um, yeah. Was, uh, you know, you said the first two years were difficult. Was that because you felt you were an immigrant, uh, a brown skin boy who is not known to be playing drum kit? Or? Yeah, so I think like uh, my understanding of like race and who I was w is very much shaped uh, later. Like the first two years, I tried not to to pay any attention to it. I just wanted to play drums. Uh, I didn't have any time to like understand uh, politically or socially where I stood, how I was being judged, how much race had a factor in how I was, you know, even just succeeding in this kind of environment, academic environment. I just wanted to play drums. I didn't, I didn't want to think about anything. I didn't want to think of myself as an immigrant, nothing. 
um, which I think now going back thinking about it was was very much also the only way I could survive like coming to a new country not knowing anyone I just had that desire to get better at a particular thing and I didn't want to have anything else come in the way of that so if I had started thinking about all these things at the time I think it might have been detrimental to my own kind of motivation in a way uh, especially as a young kid you know 22 20. Um, so I think that's what it was. I didn't really think about being an immigrant. And I think much later, like through SOAS and through like reading, further reading and uh, reading about Orientalism and re reading about <coughs> reading about just, uh, yeah, migration histories and who I am. And also then uh, meeting, in fact, for the first time, I think, in yeah, through SOAS and through Sanjuji, actually meeting a bunch of uh, South Asians, like British Asians. And realizing to my horror in a way, or shock anyway, that British Asians were very different to me. That I was this first generational immigrant and I almost thought, oh, we must be the same, you know, like we're all brown skinned, we're all Indian or whatever, South Asian. But then obviously like realizing that everyone's experiences and histories are so different. And uh, it came as a kind of rude shock. And I was still an outsider. Suddenly I was with all these Guru Bhais playing tabla. But I was still the only one who, A, could speak anything other than English fluently, had a strange accent, was still seen as this kind of other from a third world country, being exoticized, demonized the same way by white people, by, by British Asians as well. So it's like, well, hang on a minute, this is supposed to be different, I'm supposed to feel like part of this situation. But it was all great, like ultimately, like finally, I kind of realized that this whole situation is so much more nuanced and complex and layered. And then obviously, yeah, just reading more, understanding people's where they come from. And I'm hoping that now I've, I've, I've become kinder <laughs> over time rather than just being like, oh my God, what is this? These people are the same, you know. Um, but yeah, that came as a shock. Let's talk a bit about uh, the music scene in Brent because our project yeah. is uh, focused on, on Brent. And, mm. uh, um, uh, you got some support mechanism at the beginning, some awards, Steve Reed Foundation or something. Talk about that. Yeah, so the Steve Reed Foundation back in 2015 was when I decided to um, make my own album. So until then, I was just um, working as an accompanist, uh, playing for Kathak, playing for various things, that I, anything really I could get my hands on. But I decided I wanted to make this album uh, with the Siddhi community we talk about but um, so I applied for some funding from the Steve Reed Foundation um, Steve Reed was a drummer a jazz drummer who in the later years of his life at the end of his career really struggled to pay his medical bills and very sadly kind of died almost in poverty uh, so this foundation set up by uh, Giles Peterson and Brownswood recordings to help musicians in need but also to help the next generation of like emerging talent to kind of make the next step forward. Um, so they really helped me in the sense that I applied for this grant and more than the money, it was the mentorship. So I was going to get mentorship from people who I really looked up to, people like uh, Fortet, Floating Points, Emanative, all these people who were big in the music that I wanted to be part of um, and who were going to guide me through help making this album. Um, so I made this album with the help of the Steve Reed Foundation and kind of just having that backing of these very influential people really, really helped me just have that faith in myself that, okay, these people want to listen to some music that I've made. That's great. And just helped me kind of validate everything for myself. Um, it being my first album, I was very, I didn't know what to think. I didn't know whether it was any good. I didn't know who was going to listen to it. But just like knowing that there's a couple of people who I really looked up to who wanted to hear it or were curious, just helped so much, like more than anything else. And um, everything, I think in a way, my whole career is kind of snowballed from the Steve Reed Foundation because once they got involved, like the hype with their names, like I got signed to a record label, I got a booking agent, I got a manager. I had gigs, I had shows, I had, perform yeah, I mean, I was giving workshops, I did residencies then, and then I did more albums, and so everything is sort of, I feel like the Steve Reed Foundation 
was the beginning of my career as a band leader and as a composer in my own right. Let's talk a bit about your um, this recording with the Siddhis. Okay. So the Siddhis are people who, since the 8th century AD from my understanding, have moved over from East Africa to India. You know, first as merchants and sailors and traders, but also then with the slave armies of the British, the French, the Portuguese, with everybody. Um, and they, sadly, we don't know, the Siddhis is a blanket term for African diasporic community in India. We don't know exactly where these people are from, because a lot of them lost roots. Um, but they are also predominantly Muslims, Sufi Muslims. And their music is this very interesting mix of East African influences, regional Indian folk influences, and Sufi influences. So I found that fascinating, purely from a musical kind of standpoint. And I came across them when I was at SOAS, uh, studying some of the recordings of Nazir Jairazboy and his wife Amy Catlin Jairazboy. And so Amy is someone that I reached out to and said, can I, uh, I really want to make, I want to meet these musicians, especially the specific uh, performing troupe of musicians who lived in a village called Ratanpur near Bharuch in Gujarat. And I wanted to just go and see what they do, how they live, and I wanted to see their instruments, I wanted to do some field recordings. Um, so I just went and I realized that also because I could speak Gujarati, it would be easy enough to kind of go and meet these people from mostly a sort of musicology point of view, understand their music, you know. But then, of course, as soon as I got there or even started looking into them a bit more, um, so many more questions about race, about class, about caste, uh, about music came into it because they're very dark-skinned people. Um, they're a minority. They're Muslims. They're dark-skinned. It's almost the like you couldn't have been dealt a worse card if you're in India, you know. Uh, so that's where they were and they were making this music. So, I mean, you could be a woman in this verse, but anyway. Uh, and it's like they have this music that they are the only ones who perform. And I found that fascinating that there's this music and there's these instruments like the malunga, which looks almost exactly like the berimbau in, you know, in Brazil. And there was very little actual written work about the kind of transfer of music from Africa over to East and the West. I think there's so much, you know, everyone knows about Afro-Brazilian music, Afro-Cuban music, of course, blues and jazz and the whole trade of people and their cultures westwards from Africa. But very little East you know, no one really, well, I, I haven't come across much literature about the eastward trade of, of, of people and culture. So I started looking into it and I was fascinated by how many people also moved east and there were these diasporic communities all over, you know, sprinkled all over Asia. So I went and spent basically a week and a half with the Siddhis uh, in Ratanpur, just with my recorder, um, chatting to them talking, just trying to, trying to understand their motivations to making music. And then I made an album of music that was based around those recordings that I had made. I went back to a studio in Pune with a band from here, from the UK, and we just responded to a lot of those recordings that I had made. And that ultimately became the album Day to Day, which features these Siddhi recordings, but also my reaction to them and my musical response to them. So the album is not just, I mean, it would be silly for me to be making a Siddhi album, I can't. But it was more my relationship to that music, you know, and that's the kind of final, I guess, music uh, is that reaction of me and the band responding to those Siddhi recordings. And what was their reaction to what you produced? They liked it. I sent, I was very, very scared. Yes. Because this was the massive thing of like I'd gone on banging on about cultural appropriation, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Here I am doing exactly the same thing. And I was like, okay, I need to be very careful how I'm doing this. So throughout the process, I was like, look, telling them also like, this is how I'm going to use it. Are you okay with it? How do you think? And they seem, they seem fine. They didn't really say much. 
So I was very nervous. And then I think once I sent them the final album, CDs, they loved it. They were reposting it on their social media and everything. So I felt like, okay, this is a sigh of relief almost. And it was almost like a, yeah, that meant more than anything else, really. That would they were okay. Would you love to do some more work with them? Yeah, it's interesting. I would love to do more work with them. Um, I just haven't had the right opportunity to do it. But um, a lot of what we did was trying to stay in touch with some of them. Unfortunately, one of the persons who I really connected with passed away a couple of years ago, Salim Gulam Mohammed Siddi. He was this amazing Malunga player, singer, who was on the album a lot. Um, he passed away. So I kind of that that didn't help maintain that connection. So then I kind of felt a bit further away. But yeah, in the future, I would I would love to do more. And what about their uh, younger generation? Uh, is this tradition, their their music uh, culture, is it continuing? With the not so generation? much. It's not really continuing that much. N not many young people want to be playing. Um, equally, I think like the more there's interest from outside, from people like me, other people who go into this community and show that like this is there are people outside who are interested with it i was hoping that would help motivate more people also to be like oh okay there's an opportunity to go and tour in london maybe or whatever, uh, to get into this music and to kind of almost show them the value of it like in a sense from outside um but i don't think it's really translated that way um it hasn't happened but there i know there are efforts especially by amy uh to like she had this uh, malunga educational project where she they had a camp like a summer school for people to learn how to make these instruments again and play them. So there is an effort to keep it alive, the tradition, but I think with every tradition, it's just so hard to, um, you can't really, you don't know. It kind of takes its natural course. Um, it's very hard to push something into preservation, isn't it? I suppose um, there must also be influences of things like Bollywood and all of that into Absolutely. So they sing like semi-classical songs from Bollywood, but also like Bollywood songs and then they appropriate them in, onto their instrument. I think all that's fine. Like it's a way to keep the culture alive. It's a way to get young people into it. Um, and I think that's the thing. I think, you know, about tradition, any tradition, it's this fluid thing. Tradition isn't an archaic idea of what some music is. Tradition is constantly changing and evolving. And that's the only way to keep anything alive. It's the same with jazz, it's the same with Hindustani music. There has to be constant innovation, technological advancements, um, taking in influences from what's happening around you socially, politically, um, globally, like environmentally. Um, and without that, there's no, there's no, the music has no relevance. So then it might as well die out because it's not relevant to anyone. I mean, we start a bit from Sawas where you play mm. with other musicians and yeah. make it a bit more concrete what you yeah. said before. I think, um, so at SOAS I did meet a lot of people who were coming from different backgrounds um, and slowly exploring, I think through about 2013 to about, yeah, 2016, really exploring the UK jazz scene, you know, like trying to understand where jazz was at, where it was being played in the UK. So initially starting out with places, uh, the most like institutional places like Ronnie Scott's and the Barbican and the South Bank and... But then realizing that there was a whole young generation of kids playing jazz in clubs um, in places like in East London, in uh, South London, and really kind of feeling like I could be part of this scene. Seeing people at my age playing with the kind of like adventure uh, and experimentation that really excited me. You know, I wanted to be part of this kind of movement almost uh, and it really influenced me and like my music I say like I, it would never sound the way it does right now if I didn't live in London it's a very London sound it's you know this multicultural idea of also people coming from all over and being part of a scene so it's 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 a mixture of UK jazz some Indian influences and constantly kind of evolving sound uh, with experimentation which is at the core of like I think a lot of this movement and a lot of this music in U in, in London. Okay, um, just want to discuss a little bit more about um, albums like More Arriving. You seem to have uh, taken a, a satirical take on people's perception to immigration. Um, is that consciously done or uh, can you explain? Yeah, absolutely consciously done. I think what's happened over the last maybe three, four years for me is that I've got more and more confident in my own voice as a musician. 
and uh, about the kind of stance I want to take um, about issues through my music. So with more arriving, you're right, it's kind of this satirical um, take on the term itself, more arriving, you know, which has this negative connotation to it. But this idea that people are coming and they are stealing our jobs, they take diluting our culture, etc., etc. And to play with that notion and be like, look, you know, um, that doesn't necessarily have to be how we use the term more arriving. And it doesn't necessarily mean people coming is not a bad thing. They've come always, you can't stop people from moving. And I wouldn't be here without that idea of multiculturalism, you know, it's thriving really. So more arriving is about that, you know, to counter that negative rhetoric. And a lot of the songs on it are sarcastic takes on what it is to be British Asian or what it means to be South Asian as a first generational immigrant here. But it's about more than that. It's also about recognizing that there are so many different voices and experiences of being South Asian across the world. So somebody in India, in Dharavi, sounds very different, has very different needs and dreams than somebody growing up in as a third generation immigrant in Bradford. Both South Asian and both could be seen by somebody as generically just being Indian. And you couldn't be further away from the truth as in those two people are so different. So it's also about recognizing all these like multiple like brown voices while still hopefully thinking about some shared solidarity. You know, to say yes, there are all these different voices. So many things come in the way of how these experiences are understood. <coughs> Class, caste, religion, gender, all these things play into it. Equally, I'm hoping that there's certain shared solidarity that is possible between people, you know. Um, and that's what more arriving is about in a way. Um, it's about, I think it's a very, it's what a modern brown voice can sound like in 2019 when it was made. And that's what I keep saying that is, people ask me if it's an Indian record. And I say, yes, it is an Indian record, but it's also a British record. It's just my record, like, you know, whatever that is. And uh, if it, for instance, people say, if people are surprised that this is what Indian music sounds like, mm. then I think you have to question what you think Indian music is. Because how many people think about hip hop when you say Indian music? Mm. But actually right now, uh, hip hop is the largest genre of independent music in India. And that's the reality. But people again are stuck in this kind of archaic idea of what Indian music is. Still thinking about sitars, yes, thinking right. about tablas, mm -hmm. which is part of it of course, but there is this huge scene that you can't ignore. And if you're ignoring it, you're not paying enough. You're not actually interested in what's happening. You're, you're more com happy, with, comfortable with this idea of what it is and you're, you're happy with that. So I'm trying to fight that idea as well. So. You know, uh, Lata was asking about liberation rewards or dangerous ideas. Um, applied to the music, what, um, what has changed in your music and what do you think how your music has changed other people's music? Hmm. I think I try not to think about it musically in that I want it to be as organic a reflection as possible. So I just try to make the music that I'm feeling, whatever I'm interested in at the time. For example, with more arriving, I was interested in the hip hop scene in India. But of course, like coming at it from my angle, being a live musician, playing in a band which was predominantly jazz and improvised music. So the album became this combination of the two of them. Now, without thinking, that was a reflection of what British jazz, London jazz and Indian hip hop are at the time. In 2019, those two genres of music for me are the most alive. So that's what the, hopefully the music is. And if somebody listening to it now, hopefully it's a snapshot of like, yeah, of, of contemporary music. That's all. Tell me a bit about this uh, hip hop uh, music scene in India because um, uh, I am not very familiar with it. Uh, maybe I'm ignorant. No, no. Um, it's very interesting because uh, <coughs> so hip hop in India over the last maybe five years has really exploded. Mainly in the metropolis. Mainly in the metropolis. Yeah, it's a you know it's an urban music. 
um, but it's coming from, for the first time in my opinion, from predominantly working class neighborhoods, right? Independent music in India has always been um, the kind of territory or, or the occupation of the upper middle class. So people who speak English, privileged, independent music has always been guided by them. Whereas suddenly hip hop in India was coming from places like Dharavi, but also from smaller towns like Ranchi and Nagpur. And, and these kids who were rapping in their own languages, producing their own beats, local samples, local b-boys, local graffiti. So everything had a very localized feel to it. And that was what was exciting to me. It was like, wow, this is happening for the first time. And outside of Bollywood, you know, there was no money in it as such to start with. Now it's changed. That's true with anything that starts mm -hmm. underground and then has a certain amount of success. But even today, I feel like the most interesting voices in India, musically, are coming from hip hop. Um, so I just found that whole scene very fascinating. And I wanted to go again and understand this scene a bit more, you know. And then, as a result, working with some of the MCs that I met who I really liked, or on the album, um, I kind of again forged a, some sort of relationship because again, much like with the Siddhis, I knew I was not from there. Like I have a very different understanding of my experience as an Indian. I was not from, I'm not a working class kid, I'm not a Siddhi, but I was hoping that I could have a relationship to both these things just by being honest about who I am, where I'm coming from and yeah, having a musical relationship. And that's what more arriving is then. Very quickly, it became more about, more than just working with Indian hip hop because that was a part of me. But then also I was like, I can't ignore this like immigrant experience because that is my understanding of being here as well. And then be working with people like Zia Ahmed, who is an amazing like spoken word poet and really understanding um, like his experiences of being, a, you know, second generational Pakistani, British Pakistani. And the humor that's associated with his writing, I really kind of uh, connected with. Because yeah. I feel like that's also something that's very lacking often. Yeah. Is that just this, like the fact that you can laugh about it yeah. on your own, like while still making very like in incisive remarks about race in this country, but still say it in a funny way. So you're not preaching. And um, yeah, that's what has happened. You were talking about the independent music scene. Yeah. Of course, it's not just today, but it also has a history mm. versus Bollywood in India. Mm. Yeah, sure. I mean, again, from my growing up anyway, since in the 90s and 2000s, independent music in India was always, um, the way I understood it was rock bands. You know, Indian Ocean, Parikrama, Pentagram, all these bands that we grew up with uh, as Indians. But also... Um, what was then called, um, I don't know what it was called, it was, I guess it was called indie pop. People like Shan, Sonu Nigam, um, who's the girl who made, made in India, Alicia, 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 yeah. So like all these people who were like outside of Bollywood, but really famous. And that was like in a way independent until like all these major labels signed them. Since then, I don't think independent music has had the same like audience as hip hop has now. So hip hop suddenly now people are listening to hip hop. There's Bollywood films about hip hop, you know. So I think like that trajectory is really interesting of like slowly getting to a level where hip hop has come, has arrived, gully boy gets made and then suddenly now all these kids are in these Bollywood films. But also they're so big, they're playing stages where they would never have access to. These working class kids couldn't afford to pay ticket prices to go to NH7 or any of these festivals. They're headlining these festivals now, playing to upper middle class kids. So the power dy dynamics really interesting. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting time. I think like club culture in India is still very much upper middle class. Um, Ticket prices, it's not just ticket prices, it's about where these uh, clubs are located, the kind of clientele they have. Um, everything is, is very much geared towards upper middle class society. 
um that hasn't changed very much although festivals i feel like are uh, have an opportunity to bring in different kinds of people uh but again they have financial constraints and like again ticket prices are always high um i feel like the only way to battle this situation is to do diy concerts and to to have spaces or to find spaces that are outside of club culture in india i think club culture the way we understand it in the uk is very very different from club culture in india club culture here is still quite working class and like if you go to any sort of towns up especially in the north like you can get a ticket to go for 5 5 pounds to watch a band play that's not the case in in india it's very expensive so i think the way to do it in india is to just have a spa- to find spaces or create these spaces that are more democratic and more egalitarian again how do you get the money to do that who knows corporate sponsorship that's a tricky way to do it but also maybe funding from abroad potentially we're looking i'm personally looking into ways to getting funding from here to then go to india and be able to do shows where free shows maybe not ticketed all shows for very little money so that we can then create an audience of people who we really want to hear this music uh we did one show in dharavi this time and it was a free show but it was the best show we did because suddenly all these kids came and um they could see people who looked like them emceeing with us a band from the uk and that's so aspirational you can't like you can't see how much of an effect that can have and just the connection and the energy in the room at the time was just is the best we've had like none of the club shows we did had that energy um so it's definitely a way forward for me uh, that that is the way forward for me i'm like okay that's what i want to do um but yeah it's a, it's a complicated um environment music culture in in india can you talk a little bit you just came back from india from a tour mm. can you talk a little bit about this collaborations yeah so i just came back uh, last week from a tour in india we did four shows we were in new delhi uh mumbai calcutta and bangalore um and we did club shows predominantly so um and they were okay in terms of audiences i felt like they could have been a lot better there weren't that many people at these shows but again i feel like we collaborated with local mcs wherever we went which was great got to meet loads of interesting people um who got to play with live bands for the first time that's something that's really missing in the hip hop scene as well in india there's not that many live bands associated with hip hop it's all production and dj's equally what really drove home the point that i think really stayed with me was this idea of um lack of access for people who i really wanted to see my shows um ticket prices again all these same things that we talked about and doing that one show in dharavi was really an eye opener be like okay this is possible there are spaces there are people who are doing it as well and it's just about finding them digging a little bit harder and trying to make them happen so yeah that's where it is and um, so just coming back to how you elaborated when you moved over from india uh, 10 years ago do you feel that that um division is is you still feel that the distinction between how you're being treated by british asians oh, i think i'm just more aware of now i'm more aware of people's varied experiences so i know that i know not to approach a situation assuming things like i know when i meet another a british asian for example that i shouldn't assume that they have a relationship to the land that their parents or grandparents are from also that's not a given you know I think some people do have a renewed connection through themselves through having visited uh over their own lives and like formed a connection to a land that they have roots from but some people are not interested in that and that's fine as well like I don't think there's a problem with either but I just think recognizing both those paths is important um yeah me as a you know I hear a lot of british asians also say when they go to india they don't feel welcome or they don't feel indian for example or pakistani and that's the same reality like you know when i came here i didn't feel british asian i'm not i think our realities are very different and i think um just the recognition and awareness of that will help people 
come together in a way, you know, just like knowing that, yeah, we're not the same. So let's not pretend like we're the same in some ways. And in, in a sense, there's, there's a respect that could come from that, I think. Yeah. Uh, coming back to the uh, the London music scene, so I was very impressed uh, seeing you in Cafe Otto as a, as a kind of uh, experimental music yeah. collaboration, you know. And uh, I think I was very happy to see an mm. a Indian uh, collaborate with artists from this scene, which is quite a niche scene in London even. You know? Yeah, for sure. I think my interest in uh, free improvisation uh, came after studying at SOAS again. I think... Um, I was a bit disenchanted, disenchanted by structures in music, let's say. I just wanted to explore sounds and musics that could exist without judgment, without uh, a criteria necessarily that judge something as good or bad. Um, and that was, you know, coming from quite structured music like Hindustani music and jazz. Um, I wanted to break free of all that and just find play the instruments in a different way. Um, what would happen if I use chopsticks on my drum kit or on the tabla? What happens if I put my tabla through various if, uh, effects, um, analog and digital effects? All these kind of experiments that I just wanted to try. And I found the free improvised scene very welcoming in some ways. Uh, I found that I was allowed to do whatever I wanted and play however I wanted uh, in time, without time, uh, atonal music, tonal music, whatever. Um, and so I think for a while, for a couple of years, I was really intrigued by this. I wanted to only play this kind of music. And that really shaped the way when I came back to something more sort of tied into my own roots and my training, it really, like, it stayed with me. That kind of experimental uh, niche, uh, almost gene of playing, you know. And I still love doing these concerts, like you said, at Cafe Auto fully improvised concerts where um, anything can happen. There's no safety net in a sense. Um, and you're just responding to the people you're with on the day. Um, I find them very, very refreshing and really fun to do. And I want to hopefully keep doing them. Every now and again, there is good to go back to those and remembering that such a music is possible. Because uh, you get so tied into this idea of what music is and there's one way to do it so important to just go out and be like, oh, no, this is not the only way. People are doing it other ways. And it just helps to recenter, realign things. Doing the experiment with um, drum and tabla, that uh, in itself is, is quite an uh, interesting uh, thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was purely because I played both instruments and I was like, how do I find a way to also make it my own. I knew so many drummers, I knew so many tabla players. I didn't know that many people who were playing both together. Uh, and I was like, maybe I can be that guy, you know, from my Gujarati uh, businessman point of view. Like, ah, this could be a good thing to, uh, to be known for, like as my own thing, my niche. And I began experimenting with different ways to place my tabla on different sides of the drum kit, I now have my tabla on each side of my drum kit, so my left hand and right hand. So I've separated the drum in a way. Usually the drum is, the two drums are played together. I have them separate, um, separated on both sides of the drum kit. And um, that's something that I've kind of just come to like learn to play with. Um, also, like I said, the effects, like putting my tabla through various effects, manipulating the sound of the tabla um, has been something that I've been interested in. Miking the tabla internally, I have in mics inside of my tabla. Um, so it picks up different sounds from regular mics from outside. Um, that's been interesting, playing the tabla on the sides, all kinds of things that you can suddenly have access to. If you can just, if you can find a way to think about the drum away from its tradition in a way, away from the way that you've learned to play. So it's this process of unlearning and be like, it's just a drum, it's a sound source, let's find a way to make sounds out of it. That's been very like refreshing for me to kind of approach the drum in that way, because my whole training has been through playing the drum a certain way, um, and to get better in a very narrow sense of the, of, of, of the, wo of the word, really. Um, so it's been really good for me personally to be able to do that, because I think I would have lost um, I would have fallen out of love with the instrument 
and music if i was to only stay in this very kind of regimented idea of what music how music can be played does a, a, a bad review upset you or, or stop you from experimenting further depends on what the review is saying so if a review has a problem with like my motivations and my why i'm doing what i'm doing then it would upset me in the sense it would make me want to argue about why if they just didn't like the music that's totally fine like somebody doesn't like the music i'm like okay sure it's maybe not for you that's fine but i think i have a problem with somebody saying oh why is he trying to do what he's trying to do? that's like well, well then i would try and argue or that could upset me in a sense but just saying that the music's not very good doesn't upset me at all I know that it's not for everyone and that's fine. So in the step back in London um did you come across a term Asian underground? Yeah, I mean Asian underground has been a term that's thrown at me every now and again resurgence of Asian underground like people talk about my music and say oh it's coming back. And of course <coughs> growing up I was you know listening to people like Talvin uh nitin uh, also but from from the us people like karsh kale um, by of course asian dub foundation one of my favorite bands like um yeah i was aware of this i didn't really understand the gravity or the like the scale of the scene until i moved here and realized that this was a thing back in the day and um yeah it obviously was this scene that had a time and place and relevance at the time um and yeah i wish i wish i was there to see it in a way but also equally i feel like now there's a whole current crop of new uh, musicians uh, british asian musicians south asian musicians who are, who are doing interesting work like experimental work and there's slowly a scene being built i think around around that uh, there's a friend of mine called ahad who runs a night called no id which is a club uh, dj gig for south asian dj's only uh it's really interesting like and i think there's more and more sort of like slowly organically happening so who knows whether it's the next asian underground i don't know um but um yeah it's it's nice to find people um also cuz it's such a lonely occupation i feel like i don't know any other south asians doing what i do anyway you know there's very few of us like most of the people i meet are either white or black um and to see other south asians even from a distance is really nice um and a lot of people also come come up to me after gigs and say it's really nice to see <clears throat> brown people on stage in these kind of environments in in clubs um because we're not used to seeing asians on 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 stage um so yeah slowly i feel like there is maybe a network of people coming but can you say a little bit more on the asian music scene in london Yeah I mean I don't know if there is an Asian music scene as such I think there's a f- there's you know <clears throat> there's B- BBC Asian network and there's a whole scene associated to that but a lot of Punjabi music and a lot of Bollywood um I'm not so familiar with that scene to be honest like um I'm more familiar with a few other people doing more interesting like experimental work I should say interesting you know more experimental work outside of the more mainstream kind of bridgeation network type genre um but yeah i think like like i said there's a few people like friends of mine nabiha ikbal um bishi rita like there's a few people who are doing really interesting work um and i think it's important to support them um because there's so few of us and like i think they are doing really interesting work so um yeah finding ways to kind of collaborate or just show solidarity um is really important going to each other's gigs promoting each other's gigs is really it's really good who has been your best um uh, experience collaborator wise i think my best experience has been um i'd say nick woodmansey who's uh, goes by the name emanative he was part of the one of the mentors on the steve reed foundation and he has been so generous with his time and been another mentor for me uh when i was really i didn't know what i was doing in 2016 he took a lot of time out helped me produce my album first album he's mixed the next album co-produced it with me someone who's a really great sounding board for me you know someone i can call any time and be like listen to this song what do you think and would give me an honest you know uh, opinion uh, i think it's really important to surround yourself with those people who will be honest and tell you what something is and also just being able to make those calls to friends 
who are not in music i think is really important who can view your music as not part of a scene or part of a uh, larger canon of work almost just singularly be like this song is good this song is not so good um so fortunately i feel like i have those people around me um and so but nick is someone who i really yeah value a lot and in a way has been my best collaboration because he's um, yeah he's, it's it's become more than just a musical collaboration he's a really good friend now so yeah what are you working on at the moment i'm working on um, an ep coming out in uh, april which is um i mean it's done really it's tracks that didn't make uh, it on to more arriving um but tracks that i really like made around the same time the ep is called other land um but more on a larger scale i'm working on the next album uh, which should be out next year um which is um the theme of which is a more kind of futurist outlook on on the future really from a south asian perspective um i feel like we're at a time where nostalgia is playing such a large part of how we see the future um both politically and through everything even through the climate emergency everything i think the way we conceive or visualize the future is really important obviously and across the world whether it's here with brexit with the us with you know making america great again in india with this idea of a pure form of a hindu state going back to this land of virtue is very dangerous to think in those terms because a they didn't exist in the way that you're kind of imagining them and two they're all versions of something in the past so we shouldn't be future we shouldn't be thinking about or imagining a future that's based in this nostalgic sentimental idea rose tinted idea of the past is what i think and the future needs to be new and exciting and multicultural and open and something that we can't almost imagine and i think even with the climate crisis i feel like that is something that's lacking in the whole narrative where people are talking about it almost like in an age of austerity where you can only conceive of the future as less planes less plastic bottles it sounds like a more boring version of the future and that's not right we need to excite people about what the future can be like you know um and look forward to something and i think have people believe in something that's that's is positive so a future that's almost not dystopian because i feel it's almost too easy to make a dystopian future right now with everything that's happening so i want to make a a positive like a utopian almost uh, idea of what the future could be based in something very south asian now what that means i'm questioning myself right now like i don't want to be using any mythology that pre exists i feel like there is a space maybe within south asian culture to form new stories new myths maybe new gods that aren't as based in a patriarchal idea of or a class idea a caste idea it's a huge project in my mind anyway mm-hmm. uh but i'm really excited by it and i want to kind of have this album of music that is a statement to the future if that makes sense um so it's a lot of research right now it's a lot of reading um reading a lot of south asian science fiction which has been really interesting i'm reading um yeah just everything i can get my hands on uh concerning the future a little bit and um i'm i'm hopefully it's going to be an interesting That's year interesting. Mm-hmm. do you um collaborate with uh, or perform uh, um in america or europe i mean you talked about going to india and perform yeah so we do a lot in europe um especially northern europe um constantly going to germany netherlands france on tours US not so much yet we I was just in New York uh, last month uh, playing for the first time really in New York um so hopefully that's going to lead to more tours in the US I have an American passport so I should uh, be going over there but it's also about taking a band from here and the expenses and uh, but hopefully yes more in the US as well but UK and Europe is actually mainly where we do our touring and then India maybe once or twice a year if we can what's your band for it just goes by my name yes, sally yeah narcissistic <laughs> just sarthi gorwar <laughs> and yeah so fluid band as well like people who have been playing with for the last 6 7 years brilliant musicians um but it's it's a revolving set of whoever is available when they're available 
So the band can be anywhere between four people to six, seven people. Um, and depending on the project, the scale of the gig, we'd call people in.